Welcome to the Reef Resilience Webinar, Using Local Knowledge to Inform Fisheries Management in the Coral Triangle. My name is Petra McGowan, and I'm the Program Manager for the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Program, and I'm the host for this session. This webinar is brought to you through the generous support of NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Before we start, I want to share some quick information on how this webinar will work. We are going to begin the webinar with the presentation and then take questions from those of you participating. There's two ways you can ask questions. Use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions and we're going to keep track of those for the end of the session. Or you can raise your hand during the question portion of the webinar and I'll take your question during that time. You raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon on the toolbar on the left to the list of attendees. If you're having any, any technical difficulties, trouble hearing or seeing the slides, you can also send a question and let us know and we can try and resolve these issues. So I'd now like to introduce today's speakers, Richard Hamilton. Rick is the senior scientist for the Nature Conservancy's Melanesia program and he lives in Brisbane, Australia. He travels regularly to the Solomon Islands in Papua New Guinea where, where he was raised. His background is in anthropology and marine science, and he's fluent in several Melanesian languages. Some of his recent work includes using genetic fingerprinting methods to track the dispersal of larvae produced from iconic coral reef fishes such as the bumphead parrotfish and square-tail coral trout. Also, the quantification of the first known example of a reco of recovery for a Western Pacific hawksbill rookery. Rick also serves on the Board of Directors for the Society for the Conservation of Reef Fish Aggregations and is an adjunct research fellow at the ARC Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies at James Cook University. <coughs> so before I hand it over to Rick, I'd like to do a quick poll of folks on the webinar today. So we're going to put a poll up and please um, tell us, do you currently work with small-scale fisheries and or communities? Um, tell us if you do or if you don't or that you might in the future to give us an idea of your engagement with community small-scale fisheries. So we'll give you a second to fill that out. All right, so Rick, that tells you most folks are currently working with uh, what you're going to be talking about. So I'm going to hand it over to you and thanks again for presenting today. Okay, uh, thanks for that introduction, Petra. And, um, also to everyone who dialed in. I'll just sort out the technical aspects of this first and then uh, I'll, I'll take it from there. Can everyone see that? Is that... Okay. Yep. So, uh, great, thanks. <clears throat> so today I'm going to be speaking about some of the ways in which local knowledge can be used to advance research and management agendas in data pool fisheries. And the uh, examples I'll be drawing on come from the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, which make up the eastern extent of the Coral Triangle. Now this region, as many of you will know, is the epicenter for marine biodiversity. And although it only covers about 2% of the world's oceans, within that 2% you find about 75% of all the coral and coral reef fish species on Earth. Um, the marine resources of the Coral Triangle also support millions of people, uh, the majority of who are near shore subsistence and small scale commercial fishers. And while scientific data on these fisheries is sparse, many of the fishers that operate here have very detailed local knowledge on its marine ecosystems. <coughs> Just a quick outline for my talk, I'm going to be talking firstly a bit about some of the methods used for documenting local knowledge. Um, I'll then give uh, an example of the type of local knowledge you can find in coastal communities in the Coral Triangle. And then I'm going to end with some case studies overviewing how local knowledge can be used in fisheries research and uh, conservation agendas. Uh, local knowledge can be thought of as you know, a body of local knowledge which is oral and passed down over generations from one fisher to another. It's also often referred to as traditional ecological knowledge. And it can be extremely valuable in advancing research and management objectives if it's documented appropriately and if it's the consent of the custodians of this information is also obtained. 
Now, un unlike scientific studies, uh, local knowledge documentation requires some anthropological skills. Probably the most common form of documenting local knowledge is such as the one shown in this photo. It's through interviewing. And often semi-structured interviews are used, which allows the interview to flow relatively freely around a simple and predetermined core set of questions. Uh, another good way to document local knowledge is through focus groups, um, such as in the photo shown here. And this has the advantage that you can have almost instantaneous peer review with other local experts. And for any, any local knowledge survey, the use of visual aids such as maps and species IDs is essential. Another way to document local knowledge is through participatory mapping, such as in the photo shown here, where local resource, resource owners use their local knowledge of their lands and seas to identify critical habitats um, on base maps, such as turtle nesting beaches, spawning irrigation sites, etc. And probably one of the ways, which is it's not really considered much by scientists, but which the uh, anthropologists call participant observation, this is where you quite simply live among and go fishing with the communities who you're trying to understand. And this can be a really, really great way to get a really detailed understanding of how local knowledge and customs, etc., dictate fishing practices. And, and finally, uh, participatory research, where local stakeholders are involved in um, you know, a scientific agenda, is a, is a great way to understand local knowledge and it's also a really good way for two-way knowledge exchange whereby the, the scientists can provide um, local stakeholders with information which may be absent from their local knowledge bases. Now, I don't really have time to go into the, the methods of documenting local knowledge in detail here but one of the things I did want to stress is that probably if you are thinking about doing local knowledge surveys identifying your experts is critical. Uh, local knowledge like all knowledge systems is not dispersed equally in things like uh, fishing methods used, how dependent you are on marine resources, age, gender, etc. can all really dictate where local knowledge is, is found. And in, in Melanesia, spear fishermen are often uh, excellent sources of local knowledge simply because they spend so much time directly observing the marine environment during their fishing practices. And another group of people who are really essential if you're interested in sort of looking at changes that may have occurred in a fishery is older fishers. Um, and this is particularly if you uh, need to understand how fisheries may have changed over time in the absence of any quantitative data. So I just want to begin, I want to just briefly give you a little feel for the typical sort of local knowledge found within many coastal communities in the Coral Triangle. This photo here is the Roviana Lagoon in the Western Solomons. It's an area where I spent a lot of time. And here, fishing practices really dictated by a very detailed understanding of how the tides, uh, the lunar cycle and also annual seasons um, influence fish behaviour. And for, for any local knowledge survey, I think the starting point really, um, other than identifying your experts, is to get a, a handle on the uh, indigenous folk taxonomy. Uh, this can give you an indication of how detailed the local knowledge base is also going to be. And a lot of the names have information associated uh, associated with them. This example here, the bumphead parrotfish, I'll be talking a bit more about this later on, but in, in Roviana it has four separate names for different size classes of the species, uh, Lindaki going through the Topakakura, and as well as denoting different size classes, these names also give you uh, clues and indications of its ecology. For example, the two smallest size classes, uh, Lindaki and Kitkita, are only found in, in lagoonal habitats, which is their preferred juvenile uh, habitat in the species. Now, in Raviana, or even where local knowledge fact taxonomy is very detailed, for species which aren't of any value to the subsistence system, they, they generally aren't named. And probably the best example of this is the damselfish. There's about 300 species of damselfish in the Coral Triangle. But in Raviana, although they recognize that there's many different species, they're all just collectively referred to as kipper. <coughs> A couple of photos here just to show um, how lunar and um, seasonal knowledge is used to inform fishing success. The photo on the on the left here shows a catch of barracuda, which a Roviana spear fisherman obtained after night drop lining all night. Now this species is known locally as pippo and it's well recognized that these aggregations only form between September and December each year. And that's when the fishing pressure changes to, to target these aggregations. This other fish shown here, the giant trevally, there's some very detailed knowledge on when and where aggregations of this species occur. 
It occurs in a certain passage area in Roviana on the seventh lunar day um, of each month, and it's actually feeding aggregations turning up to feed on spawning aggregations of rabbit fish. So you can see some of the ways in which local knowledge is used, primarily to ensure fishing success. Okay, I'll turn, I'll turn to my case studies now, and the first case study I want to discuss is the way in which local knowledge can be used in data poor fishery stock assessments. And the, the fishery I want to talk about a bit here is this type of fishery, the bumphead parrotfish in the western province of, of Solomon Islands. Now, fishing for the species for generations has focused on or been based around an understanding of their nocturnal behaviour. The species, as you can see here, uh, sleeps in shallow water at night on coral reefs, often in quite exposed areas because they're a big fish. And it's this knowledge of where they sleep which has sort of made this fishery successful for, for thousands of years. Now, traditionally, until fairly recently, the method was hand spearing from a dugout canoe and fishermen would plait dried coconut fronds uh, paddle to an area where they knew these soap are often slept and then spear them with, with uh, hand-held spears. This fishery was replaced in the 1970s with the introduction of, of underwater masks, uh, fins, also rubber-powered spears. Very quickly this traditional method was replaced with free diving uh, simply because it's a far more efficient uh, fishing method. And then what happened in the Roviana Lagoon in the 1980s with the development of markets for this species that very quickly this fishery became commercialised. Now, in order, in order to get an understanding of how these technological and market changes have affected the fisheries, what I did was I interviewed spear fishermen who'd been involved in the fishery from the 1970s and other fishermen involved right up into 2010. And what you can see here is a quite clear picture. Maximum catches in the 1970s and 80s were about 70 adults per boat per night. Now, we use maximum catch when we look at these sort of things in local knowledge surveys because positive memory is better retained than, for example, asking fishermen what their mean catches were. And you can see catches decline very rapidly through the 80s and then down in the, into the 90s. And in 2000, these declines actually resulted in the establishment of some marine protected areas in Robiana Lagoon to try and help um, this species recover. This hasn't been particularly successful, as you can see from the end of this graph. Um, and maximum catches now in 2010 were approximately 10% of what they were in the 70s and, and 80s, and this fishery has essentially collapsed. Coinciding with these declines has been a shift in the fishery from a, a fishery dominated almost exclusively by adults to a fishery which is now dominated by juveniles. Okay, the, the second case study which I, I, I wanted to draw on was the ways in which local knowledge can be used to cost-effectively identify critical habitats. And the example I'm going to draw on is um, a study I was involved in about a decade ago, a local knowledge survey to identify fish spawning aggregation sites in New Island province of Papua New Guinea. Uh, I did this in 2004 with a colleague of mine, Tapas Potoku, but prior to this, a few years earlier, the Nature Conservancy had done a survey in the same geographies trying to identify spawning aggregation sites through a dive survey. Essentially, the, the scientists were looking on maps and identifying sites where they thought that aggregations might form and then diving at these sites to look to see if they could see any aggregations. That scientific survey went for about two weeks and they were unable to identify any spawning aggregation sites. But in, in two weeks of speaking to fishermen, uh, Tapas Potoku and I were able to identify 28 spawning aggregation sites in, in the same geography and we identified a lot of information on where these sites were, species that aggregated their, their status and their lunar and seasonal seasons, etc. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that also came out of these local knowledge surveys was that uh, these aggregations were sort of across the board in decline and on the back of this we used this information to have discussions with local communities and this, is, this resulted in the establishment of small community-based marine protected areas at some of these uh, large aggregation sites and also the establishment of community-based monitoring at some of these aggregation sites. And this, this has been pretty successful in some of these areas in, in uh, New Ireland. As you can see from this example, this fish here, the camouflage grouper, aggregates in New Ireland from about March to July each year. And this is um, off a transect from one of the major aggregation sites which was protected in 2004 and you can see that following protection in 2004 there's been a, quite a remarkable recovery at this aggregation site. <coughs> okay, the last, the last one I, I, I want to touch on is um, 
the way in which local knowledge and local expertise can be used to sort of advance research agendas and also to get stakeholder buy-in from the results that come out of these programs. And I'm going to talk about some work we did looking at the larval dispersal of, um, of the coral trout, the species shown here, the square-tailed coral trout. And this is done in Manus in Papua New Guinea. Now this, this involved a great deal of collaboration with, with local fishermen. Uh, in the first phase, we lived on these canoes for about a couple of weeks out at the aggregation site uh, at the period where we knew from local knowledge that these aggregations uh, formed. And working with about 40 excuse me, local fishermen, we fished this site for two weeks, uh, captured all the adults we could, took a fin clip on them for genetic analysis, and then uh, released the fish back into the water. The second phase of this research occurred about five months later, and this involved working with over 100 local spear fishermen across over 100 kilometres of coast on the south coast of Manus. And <clears throat> over about a two-month period, these are quite cryptic little species. We, we captured about 700 juveniles, and we took a fin clip um, off each one, and then we were able to use genetic fingerprinting to match juveniles back to one or two of their parents at the spawning aggregation site in Manus. Now, this is basically the <coughs> the, uh, the crux, the outcomes of that work. You can see here the, the adult sample. This is the spawning aggregation site. Now, these yellow dots show juveniles, which we could link back to one or two of their parents from the spawning aggregation site. And really, I guess the take-home message is that a lot of larvae is retained close to source. So it's good news for community-based management because essentially what it means is that if you're protecting some of these critical sites like your spawning aggregation sites, a lot of the larvae is recruiting back into nearby areas which are open to fishing. So you're getting, you're getting spillover benefits from, from your community-based efforts. Um, probably more importantly though in the context of this, this discussion is the way in which this knowledge has been used. Um, because of all this stakeholder involvement, uh, it's been very easy to, to use this information to inform management and currently the Manus Endras Development Network is now working with us to use this connectivity information to develop a network of protected areas across the Howell south coast of Manus. Um, I just wanted to end by uh, highlighting some of the limitations of local knowledge. I think um, local knowledge, like any knowledge system, can be wrong. Um, and so it's important, especially if you're going to use local knowledge for management or conservation decisions, to where, where at all possible independently validate, validate that information uh, before it's used for those decisions. Uh, the other thing that's worth highlighting is that local knowledge only really provides part of a picture. Um, it's based on observations and information such as larval dispersal, growth rates, etc. of, of reef fish simply won't be present in local knowledge bases. And I guess <clears throat> the last point is that it's, it's, probably, it, it's probably important to realize that observation and interpretation are quite distinct activities. And um, the example I want to use here is from this photo shown here. This is a pearl fish. These little fish live inside the uh, gut cavities of sea cucumbers. And this, this is well known across, across Melanesia. People harvest sea cucumbers. They'll often see these pearl fish within their gut cavities. But the general perception in Melanesia is that these little fish are actually the um, larval stages of adult reef fish, which are important in the fisheries. And, and while that interpretation is, is not correct, the observation of these pearl fish living within the sandfish is indeed correct. Um, so I'm just going to leave it there, and I'll just put up a few references which, which might be useful if you want to read a little bit more on this topic. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Rick. Um, it's time for some questions right now, so if you'd like to send me your question or raise your hand, I can also try to call on you, which is always nice to hear other voices. So um, raise your hand or send any questions through your question box. So Rick, the first question I, um, that has come in is you, you talked about some different case studies. Um, but in general, what do you think the biggest challenges are to implementing this type of integration of local knowledge into, into science right now? What, what are the biggest challenges you would tell people to be aware of, I guess? Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about 
the, the audience's background, but I think uh, probably within the Conservancy we don't have a lot of uh, social science backgrounds. It's more, mm -hmm. it's more uh, the applied sciences. So the, the methodologies for documenting local knowledge are, are, are different from hard sciences. Mm. So that's that's probably probably one of the one of the limitations, and and I think because of that also um, sometimes there's not there, there can be a little bit of doubt about the value of this sort of work. But but I'd have to say I'd have to say the NGOs certainly in areas like the Coral Triangle um, rely a lot on local knowledge, and, and in certain areas there's certainly a lot of um, efforts to incorporate that and use that where possible. Okay, thanks. So we have um, some questions from folks raising their hands. So first I'll call on Rod Salm. Rod, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi, and thanks very much, Rick. That was very interesting. Of course, hey, it makes me anxious to get out there. But um, <laughs> I wondered, you know, when, with it, when you're working with tra traditional knowledge, how you introduce, as you evidently have done very effectively in, in Choiceful and now Isabel, how do you introduce um, uh, concepts like climate change and and how climate change may have impacts on these uh, species? How do how do they how does that mesh with with uh, their local knowledge, their traditional knowledge, and how do they accept these new new fangled ideas that perhaps you know they haven't had a great history of dealing with? Yeah, thanks, Rod. Well, I think, firstly, I don't think that the, the climate change may be new, but places like the Solomons have been bombarded with climate change um, activities at the moment. But I, I, for me, I, the, the way I, I deal with climate change is, is really just around this concept of you know healthy systems or resilient systems. And mm -hmm. I, I normally actually link it back to disease. So I say if you think of a reef mm -hmm. as being like a human being, if it has malaria and then something else comes along, normally you're... You know, you're knocked over. But if you, if you, I'm sorry. I mean, if you're a healthy person and you get malaria, which is prevalent in these areas, normally you recover. But if your system's already degraded by all these other aspects, something else comes along, and then it's, you know, it's it's too late to do anything about it. That the climate change, especially in terms of the sea level rise, is quite prevalent in some of these areas we work in. So people are fairly aware of these changes. Great. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Rick. Okay. Uh, I'd also like to call on Sarah. Sarah, I'm unmuting you. Would you like to ask your question? Hi. Thank you. I need to mute first. Whoop. We lost that. Sorry, lost I'm, it. I'm oh. hearing an echo. So. Oh. We can hear you. Okay. Um, I am a member of the EDF Oceans Program, and we also have a similar challenge at TMC of having a shortage of social scientists. And I'm just wondering, Rick, if you have um, recommendations for what it takes to adequately train people in the methodologies for collecting local ecological knowledge, <laughs> and if there are any additional resources you might recommend that we access. Sure. I think, I think one of the, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a funny one because on one hand, you need to. I mean, ideally, you, ideally, you're working in in a language which you understand, or if not, you're working with someone who who speaks your language and also the language of the people you wanted to interview. That's probably a, a, a critical first step. But I think it's also really important not to not to just think, oh, well, we need a social scientist. We'll get a social scientist to do this because really, you you, you need you need to have an understanding of the fisheries and. And, and marine ecology to do these things effectively because local fishers have a good idea of what's going on and they'll pick up fairly quickly whether or not you know anything about marine systems and fisheries. So I think I think it's I think it's doable. Um, I think the language component is critical. Language and, and, and a cultural understanding is, is critical. Um, in terms of resources, there's quite a lot of resources out there on how to do local knowledge surveys. Um, the, the one I I've been involved in developing is that that second reference there, which actually has a a whole a whole checklist of ways to conduct local knowledge surveys. That's that's fairly specific in relation to spawning aggregation sites, but a lot of the information in that book chapter is relevant to all types of local knowledge surveys. Mm 
I mean, to give to give you an example, I'd be I'd be very uh, hesitant about going and doing local knowledge surveys on terrestrial systems, simply because <clears throat> my knowledge of terrestrial systems is pretty poor. Even if I was well aware of how to conduct those local knowledge surveys, often you're you're kind of like looking for information. You're not even really necessarily aware what you might find out, which is why you use those those semi-structured interviews so people can lead you in the areas they're knowledgeable about. Great. Okay. Thanks, Rick. So another question um, is: you you mentioned some of the limitations. Um, do you have an example that kind of illustrates uh, how how people should be aware? Because you you listed some good limitations, but do you have a specific example that you can show or tell us where you've seen that? this kind of marriage of the local knowledge and the, the science hasn't panned out so well to understand those limitations a bit better. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the really common ones is that, I mean, this local knowledge is cultural as well. So how that observational information is interpreted and used may be quite different from how, how say, a, a scientist would interpret it. So, for example, in, in Melanesia, what often happens is people have these understandings that, you know, things have changed, fisheries maybe aren't what they used to be, but the interpretation there might be that they've upset the gods, etc. Now, as soon as a Western biologist hears that, they normally just throw out all the observational information as well, because it doesn't fit with their own schemas. So that, that, that would be one example of where it's important to realise that those things can be different. There's <coughs> um, numerous examples of where local knowledge hasn't been accurate. Um, we did a, a study in, in Roviana Lagoon where the lunar, the um, aggregating season was quite different from what the local knowledge base said. Now, whether or not that related to changes that have occurred or simply a case of borrowing local knowledge from one geography and putting it somewhere else where it didn't quite fit, who knows. But I, I think it's, it's really important. It's, it's important not to over-romanticize local knowledge. Um, it's, it's knowledge, but you know, it's, not, it's not always correct, as is science. Okay. All right. Well, um, so we have a time for probably one more question. And, um, you know, you definitely made the case for why integrating local knowledge into research makes sense. But um, often those types of managers that we have in the network, they really need to understand what kind of resources it takes to implement this kind of approach versus a traditional approach. So can you give them some ideas on like time or funding that would be needed um, to do this kind of work? Or where would, they, where would they start other than the references that you've provided if they were interested in pursuing this type of project with their current research or monitoring programs? Um, I guess that, that question is really is how long is a piece of string, but it, 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 depends <laughs> on, it depends on what your question is. I think before you start any local knowledge survey, you need to probably read all you can about that area, about, mm -hmm. about the, the custom. But the, the example from uh, New Ireland, I think that the local knowledge survey we did there when we identified 28 to 20 aggregation sites was probably a magnitude cheaper than the uh, the dive survey, which didn't manage mm -hmm. to identify any. Um, in some areas, you don't have good local knowledge bases, so um, be prepared for the fact that you could do a local knowledge survey and it might not turn up much. But I would caution on that because I've, I've worked in a lot of places where people have told me that fishermen knew nothing, and that's turned out to be quite the opposite. It was really a case of people never actually asking the fishermen anything. Hmm. So, so I, I think it, 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 depends, it depends a lot on the question and, and what you're trying to find out. Certainly in terms of identifying critical habitats, it's, um, it's a bit of a no-brainer in my opinion. Great. All right. Well, if you have additional questions for Rick, he's glad to take them, but we're out of time, so you can – is his – sorry, is his email going to be up? Is, yeah, I think his emails or 
No, it's not. Sorry. Yes, it is. There we go. So his email's up if you have any other questions, and um, he'd be glad to answer those. And we want to thank everybody for joining us, and thanks, Rick, again, for this great presentation and question and answer period. The recording of this webinar, as well as the resource links, are going to be sent out to the network after today. And if you're not currently on our network list and would like to be, please email us at resilience at tnc work and send us any suggestions for future webinar topics to that same email. Um, look for our next webinar announcement coming soon and also give us feedback on this new format of a kind of abbreviated webinar and tell us if you like the 30 minute format or an hour format as we're you know, experimenting with uh, what works for those of you guys in the field and what kind of format and time frame fits into your schedules and let us know. All right, thanks again, Rick, for the presentation. Thank you. Okay.